Holanda founded the winery of Alduero in 1984. So uh, it's a long time, but I'm just comparing to, let's say, other uh, wineries. Uh, they are in the third, fourth, fifth generation. So in the Alduero, in Alduero, we are on the first generation. So just to give you a picture, uh, Yolanda now, she is the oldest member of the Rivera Duro Council. And the only woman, I mean, the oldest means the person who has been the most time on it. And she's also the only woman part of this council. So we are in the in a history of success of uh, doing quality wines. And I think we have, we are playing a role doing only um, a profile which is focused on trying to, not to be a big winery, but doing big wines. What are the most special wines you produce? Well, Balduero, um, does not produce wine every year. This is also something quite unique about our wines. For example, 2013 and 2008, if you go to Vivino, you can search the uh, ratings per year, right? You can select different vintages and check the ratings. So uh, 2013 and 2008, if you search for some of our wines like Luna Cepa, you will see they don't have. They have like maybe 10, it's like an error in the application. And the other vintage, he has 2,000. So uh, in the same fashion, is in the best vintages, the best vintages of Rivera Duero are 2010 was the absolute best, followed by maybe 2001, then 2011, and then 1991. That will be, let's see, the four best. So um, we not only produce only the good vintages like 2030, 2008, we don't produce the grand, the, res, the grand reservas because we don't produce any young wines. All the wines are oaked because uh, the winemaker philosophy, Yolanda's philosophy is that uh, it's like having a, a kid with a lot of ta talent for the art. So you don't want to give him uh, coloring books. You want to give him an oil and a canvas, so he and can. How do you know if it's a good wine or not, the vintage? Well, this has to do with the climate conditions mainly during this particular period of the year. So we are now on the critical stage. If today it starts raining heavily, and then it stops, and we get like a lot of sun and heat. It's going to be really bad. So okay. it's actually based on random uh, weather conditions. So you already know if the, this vintage will be a good vintage. When we harvest it, we already know how it's like when you do an exam, right? When you come out, you can't get an idea of the score you're going to get. There are surprises, but it's not likely you normally, you know, you answer right. You mistaken so you know I'm I got a good score average so uh, well my point was that what Yolanda does is she after the harvest she meets all the uh, technical team and uh, they uh, decide whether uh, they are going to or not produce grand reserve and then if the vintage is absolutely fantastic like 2010 or 2001, then they decide to start our very special wines. That's have to answer your question. So that means that our best wines, like the, the 12 años or the or the Cepa Premium, these wines they do not ever touch the deposits. They only are bumped on uh, barrels of uh, 500 uh, 500 liters manually bumped, and they choose in the very, very best vintages, the very, very best rate. And um, also, I, I like to mention here that, uh, let's say in comparison to other wineries like what could 
And now that we're talking about the Gechi culture, about the vine, that's all that makes uh, the wine special, it's about the vines. We still, of course, use like really micro vinifications, but uh, it's all about the vine here. So we are the second biggest owners of low boost vineyard in Spain. And um, everything is manual. Because all of your grapes come from your vines, from your own fields? Of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, I mean, we actually sell the grape that we think is not good enough for Valduero. So okay. we have groups biting, trying to get from us what we don't want. For example, in 2013, the, the wine was not good enough for Valduero. So instead of bottling it, we sell to another group who is interested. All the grapes, like that. So, and this is the philosophy overall. Not only to do everything as it's best, do every procedure the, the best way that there is. Not minding about the cost, not minding about, just try to make it as good as possible. So you see now uh, all the vines, and we have 140 hectares, which is a lot. It's a lot. We know we only produce in these 140 hectares 300,000 bottles only. So the yieldings, we're talking there between 1,500 to 3,000 something only. That's ridiculous. In each, in each parcel, it's all low bus, so it's no possibility to use any machinery. It's um, um, each, in each parcel, we know how many plants there are and how many bunches there are. That's totally crazy. So, and, and we have huge teams of people just going through all the all the parcels, all of the rows of wine, of vines, checking each plant and making sure it has an, uh, a certain limited number of bunches. For example, they have to check this row and it can only have four bunches. Like una cepa wine, uh, this one, for example, is done on four bunches per plant, which gives around um, 150 to 300 grams maximum of uh, per bunch. So it effectively makes one plant, one bottle. Okay. So actually the best way to make the wine better, the, the let's say the most practical way is to reduce the amount of grape that the plant produces because the plant is going to get all the uh, energy from the soil, from the sun, and it's going to use all its energy, its energy trying to reproduce itself. So if you limit the amount of grape that it is producing, uh, it will definitely make better grapes because all this energy is going to focus on a really small production. So this is all about uh, manually checking each plant, reducing a lot the amount of grape that it is produced, and uh, then um, during the harvest, this is uh, I, I've seen myself uh, during the harvest. Uh, imagine there's no fruit in the world that since it was it was in the plant uh, and um, it is in the plant. And then it's under control in the deposit in only 15 minutes. And it doesn't touch any machine. So there's a truck waiting in the in the parcel where the, there's like people hand harvesting in 14 kilo baskets. So it, they, they do it in 14 kilo baskets. So when you put the grape on top of each other, it doesn't break and it does not start an uncontrolled fermentation. So it's hand picked and put in 14 kilo baskets. Then it's loaded into the truck and the truck is ready when it he, he runs away to the winery and they are really waiting for it. So they measure the weight of the truck and they know how much it weighs without the grape. So they can effectively measure how much grape does it have uh, after being loaded. Then he goes up the cliff, uh, up the cliff. So because Valduero, uh, we have like an underground, really, really big underground tunnels, right? To do like a more efficient, more ecological, and less reliable on the energy. Uh, it saves a lot of cost to be under the bomb actually, because of the temperature and the light and everything. So in the top of the mountain, we have 
a really big hand uh, selection table with up to eight, ten people. They start uh, unloading all the grapes on the truck. They put it on the table. They start choosing their best grapes, uh, like discarding what is not uh, good. There was a previous selection because it was hand harvest. It's not like we did it with machines. There was a previous selection, but they would check and check again. And then it falls down to 10,000 liters deposits. I can I will send you pictures also. This is a new system because before we used to, we are now changing to only 10,000 liter system. And uh, by gravity, the, the grid falls down and this all happens in 15 minutes, the whole operation. So if everything is planned, everything is done, everything is uh, studied to accomplish the best quality possible. And uh, we never, uh, try to save cost or make it more efficient. We are always philosophy is to make the best one. That, that's so what I understand is that um, you harvest the grapes um, hand picked, so the people know which grapes are good and which ones are not. So they pick both, or they only pick the best. The people in the field, they are asked to take only what, what is good. And then the rest, it's the second time that you harvest it and then you sell it. Uh, they make a first selection on the, well, there's a, before the harvest, they will check on the vines and they will remove yes. what it is not good. During the harvest, they are asked to get only the good grain. And okay. after it is harvested and it arrives uh, in the truck to the hand selection table, they will still make a last comprobation before it goes to the deposits. Uh, for example, if a grape is broken, it should be removed immediately. Yeah. Or um, one. So it's good that it has like many filters because this helps. And even afterwards, after it falls to the deposits, the whole idea about using these really small ones, like 10,000 liters, is that if something goes wrong, you can split. Uh, if you use really big ones like 50,000 liters or 100, like in some regions of Spain, based on the volume, yes. In order, in the, in the let's say cheaper wines are normally produced like in bigger volumes, and that makes it more efficient, but at the same time gives you less control about the vinification. So, for example, if you use a 100,000 liter deposit, then you put a lot of grape into it. Maybe you cannot select it manually. You just use machines and make it as efficient as possible, then you don't have this control about the final quality. Because if you're using 10,000 liter ones, even after all these controls that I explained, then uh, you will still have to, um, you can still, the enologist and the technical team, Yolanda, they will go and taste each deposit final outcome. And maybe they decide to blend one with this one to make a desired profile, or maybe they decide to discard one, they have more room to create by having these small, uh, small deposits. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated process. Yeah, we are lucky. Actually, I think the only secret, uh, well, the only secret is that um, Yolanda has almost 40 years of experience. Uh, doing uh, quality wines from the Duero. And it's her own winery. She gets to choose how and she wants to do the wines. So she's like, uh, she can choose. And she's always really committed to do good quality. So I think in the end, a good winery comes because the good wine making, of course, and the experience. And uh, I think we the wines are going up in quality uh, each year. Uh, we we're tasting sometimes the different vintages to compare. And, um, but for wine, you only have one chance a year. If the vintage is bad, it will be bad. You, you have one, one chance every year. Some years, it's not gonna be good. Some years, it was the year to do it. And then afterwards, to do quality wines like we're doing Valuero, you have to wait many years to see the results. Because then it goes to the stainless steel vats of um, 50,000 liters or 10,000 liters. And then um, once it's there, you uh, move it to oak barrels. Yes. Uh, so with the new system, 
it's all uh, this is the mountain okay let's see so you have the, the hand uh, selection here so yes. then the grade falls to the deposits which are here 10,000 liters and then the grade falls from the deposits after the fermentation to barrels so the barrels are located right below the the deposits and um, the oaking process um, is actually really important for us because we are located over eight over 800 meters of altitude this is super high, super high so this is actually um makes a really kind of risky wine so when yolanda came um the 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 town's folk they did not like to cultivate in these areas because it was quite risky <laughs> why would yeah. you get like in these high altitudes uh, it's really complicated you might lose uh, the grade but uh, she, as an enologist, she had studied in Bordeaux and in Madrid. She knew that it was actually the French knew that it was in slopes in the high altitude where you could get the best quality at a risk. So um, um, this is why uh, uh, we started doing the wines in these altitudes. And but my point was uh, answering your question. Sorry, because I, uh, about the oaking process. Um, we only use Tempranillo. Why? Because she thinks that if, when she came here to these high altitudes, uh, it was the only red grape able to survive naturally yes. without any human help. So therefore, uh, she has experimented with other varietals and blend you, but she doesn't like it. She likes to use different Tempranillo clones and uh, therefore the oaking process becomes much, 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 much more important now let's say in Rioja. Yes. Why? Because it's one of the most important tools that she has to get the desired and profile, the desired style and profile of the wines. If you have more varietals to blend, you can um, you can get uh, uh, your own style of wine. But when you only have one varietal, then the oaking process and the quality of the oak makes a big difference. So. To give you a picture, we have 3,000 uh, barrel oaks in this winery for 300,000 bottles each year. This means all our red wines spend at least 16 months in oak. That's a very Six. long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And well, um, I think the, the youngest we have now is 2018. We don't have any anyone younger than that, I, um, because this also philosophy is that the reserva is not made reserva by the barrel aging and the bottle aging. It's just born reserva and then given the proper conditions to be able to express its full potential. So we think it will be the same to a, after doing all this labor that is playing on the on the field on the vines to just release the wine too early. Yeah. So we try to hold as much as possible. Still, if we release in 2018 the, the earliest, that means we don't get any results. We have to have everything stopped for four years. Think about economically, this is really difficult. So this is why each year we try to hold the wine a bit longer. But uh, of course, in the beginning, uh, Carolina, Carolina is uh, Yolanda's sister. She's my boss, she's responsible for the communication, marketing, export of the, um, of the wines. Uh, they want to hold it uh, as long as possible so the wine gets the time that it needs to express its quality. But in the beginning, they, they, they will not, of course, stop everything for four years. Yes. Now, uh, after they have been working on this uh, almost, as I say, 40 years, almost, it's such a long time, since the beginning, they have the, the the savings to uh, hold the wine a little bit so it gets better. And um, well, actually, they gave us, for example, uh, the Una Cepa, this wine that uh, um, they gave us for Christmas, the 2011, I think it was. Ah, yeah. that's a very yes. nice present. Yes, yes. And, and it was tricky. Of course, of course, <laughs> I think. And, and, and I didn't share. <laughs> I, I, I actually tasted with my so many friends uh, to, to see yeah, and compare. 
it was much better than the actual vintage now because of the time in the bottle. Yes. Yeah. So it's actually you have managed to hold it. It gets better. Uh, yeah. Actually. And you also have a private cellar in the in the winery. Of course. Uh, well, there's like a family cellar. Uh, was, uh, de la familia, reserva de la familia. So it's like a, a cellar only for them, for Carolina and Yolanda's parents, you know, people who they invite to the winery. They have vintages, but also, for example, 2019 was a, a fantastic, fantastic vintage. Also, I, I'm not, I did not mention it before because we have to wait until we see the final results. But it looks, seems quite promising to produce. Uh, wines uh, of really high quality and now they are all stored waiting they are already produced they are on the bottles so we um, we have we have like this kind of um, it's like our legacy right we Balduero is the is the only winery i can guarantee you in Rivera del Duero i don't know if in Spain in Rivera del Duero list that you can come in ask for a, a Rivera del Duero from 1991 90, and they will bring it to you directly from this private server. Like that, we have. Uh, it's impressive. Uh, yes, you can come in, and this is happening to us people, private clients coming and asking for these really super exclusive bottles. That, of course, this for us is like, uh, we give like a, a lot of value because it's, imagine that. The Rivera uh, was founded. Um, uh, 40 years ago, so in 1991, 31 years ago now, the vintage was the best so far. So Yolanda decided to keep the best grape that she had and give it the best uh, uh, called the vinification system that she could use and then store it for this amount of time. So imagine how how this is like a really exclusive. Uh, uh, this also, I think, uh, talks about uh, this special wine that uh, we discussed before. And um, also, just to finish with the vinification about the bottle aging, um, and um, it's like um, when you are first day at the school, um, so everything is mixed up. You don't know anyone. So all your all the people who is going to be in your class, it's already there, and you don't know them. So you might sit down the guy who might or not be your friend in, in, in the upcoming year. But after five months, everything is integrated, everyone knows its place, and you are sitting with your friends. So that's why the uh, we the we let the wine stay a little bit in the bottle. When we bottle it, the elements are already there, but they are found here um, under the cows. They are not stable. So we just give it a little time to rest, stabilize, and find its place. And so how do you know when it's ready? They try it. They try it. They try it. And actually, maybe, for example, now we market the wine of uh, 1991 as we can give it the commercial wine La Antigua. That's the commercial name. But when Yolanda prepared it, she did not know uh, what the name was going to be look, look yeah. like. She discussed with Carolina afterwards, they make the decision. But um, so it's like um, they, she just prepared it. And then afterwards, they taste it and say, OK, it's fantastic. Now. Yes, let, let's commercialize it, you know, or let's give it this name or this not commercial. Well, for this wine, not commercialize it. Let's just give it a name. Let's give it identity. Let's give it a soul. Let's put a, a label on it, you know. And uh, so, in the end, sometimes it goes wrong as well. Yeah. Because oh. it's such a personal product. That is it. Um, sometimes when you need to market the wines and then sell it, that you're thinking, oh, that's a pity that the wines leave the winery. Uh, no, for me, I actually. <laughs> I know because I told you I, 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 I travel a lot, so I, I feel really glad to, when I, for me, 
the people I I work with, they are like my friends because I'm all the time traveling. So I feel glad to be able to, to drink a, a good wine, you know, when I need them, uh, because I love it. And you can tell it that it's uh, so. I I think the wines I want to enjoy, not to stay here forever. Like uh, yes. it's uh, means uh, the wine is just made for a moment of celebration, a moment of fun. I think it's it must. Uh, I'm I'm happy, of course, each time um, the wine leaves. Uh, it means it's working. Uh, it's uh, it's been. Uh, recognize, enjoy, I love it. And then when people say, oh, I love this wine, then it's even better. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, we, we, I actually um, uh, like to bring it with my friends who are in the wine business and re really appreciate also the quality. They work in another wine list and, and they ask me to bring and uh, we taste together, we compare. I think it's a uh, uh, for me, I love this part of the this segment in the wine industry because it's like a, if you are a wine professional, you enjoy much more working with uh, this kind of product, you know, about uh, with this really high quality. Because uh, of course, I I love wine. I, I don't want to drink like <laughs> you know bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it it was very nice speaking to you, Pablo, and thank you very much for all the information you. and your time. I hope, hope to see you soon and well, if you have anything you you want to discuss or ask anyone who wants this interview, please feel free to write me and I'm open to to answer you as well as I can. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Pablo. <laughs> have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you.